guys welcome to no filter hd this is episode 93 uh, ballistic coffee boy here your host so we are continuing on with llama soft the jeff mentor story this awesome interactive documentary by digital clips just fantastic so uh, this is actually part four and we're beginning chapter three and it's a little confusing but chapter two ran a little long uh, so chapter three is the light fantastic and we're taking a look at jeff mentors work with the visual light management and all that good stuff so basically um, lights and music so um, uh, think the iTunes visualizer that's this is kind of where that all started so Jeff Mentor was definitely ahead of his time uh, for sure so I can't wait to dig into this one this is gonna be so fun so I do have a Jaguar CD and I do have the VLM on there the uh, visual light uh, software and basically, when you put in a CD, it plays, and you can control the visuals on the screen, very much like what we came later to know as iTunes Visualizer. So, uh, but he started it first. So let's look at Chapter 3, The Light Fantastic. Moving beyond pure gameplay, Jeff develops a new sort of computer program, The Light Synthesizer. And I actually have a copy of this from my Atari 800 computer on floppy, and I freaking love color space. Seeing the light. As 84 drew to a close, Lamasov's success meant that Jeff had the financial freedom to fulfill some lifelong dreams while experimenting with new software ideas, one of which was not a game at all. Hmm, what was it? About to find out. <laughs> Land of Llamas. In September 84, Jeff embarked on a two-week tour of Peru, one of the few countries with the native population of llamas in addition to other camelids like alpacas and vicunas. This finally gave him a chance to get up close and personal with the animals that gave Llama Soft its name. Love it. So I'm going to turn off the captions here so you can see the pictures a little better. Love that. Very stylish. Mentorviews. Everywhere I looked, I could see llama stuff. Shops selling llama rugs, llama pictures, models of llamas, postcards with llamas on them, silver llamas, llama jumpers by the zillion. 84. <laughs> Cuddling a llama. Judging by the expression on that llama's face and the position of the ears, I was lucky not to get a face full of llama spit. He looks cross. These days, knowing llamas rather better through living kept a couple for many years, I would treat him with more respect. 84. Very sweet. Love it. I'm sure the llama didn't mind, right? Nature of the Beast, Issue 3. Jeff described his tour of Peru in depth in the third issue of his newsletter, The Nature of the Beast. And this is really cool. He put out his own newsletter, of course, as we've been talking about. This is, this is kind of the equivalent of devs doing videos for YouTube these days, talking about their game development and everything. Just very cool. Very cool of Jeff to do that. Keep his fans in the loop. So feel free to read these. Pause the screen if you would like. Um, I read mostly everything in this compilation except for a 80 page manual of software we'll talk about later on in this chapter. I didn't want to go through all that. Mentor views. I returned to England laden with llama gear and two liters of Inca Cola, which, was, which has since run out. The idea for my next game, a refreshed brain and a burning desire to return. 84. Love to hear it. Psychedelia. While Jeff first began work on a different game following his return from Peru, he quickly switched gears when he was struck with the idea for Psychedelia, a light synthesizer in which the player could use a joystick to create and control patterns of lights on the computer screen. This was meant to be used to accompany a musical performance. Let's take a look at this uh, cassette here. Very cool. And uh, we will play uh, this application or game. Uh, Psychedelia Complexity for Llamas, C6484. 
The first Llama Soft Light Synthesizer, Psychedelia was not a game, but an instrument used to create light shows to accompany music. Let's take a look at this. Okay, so not sure what I'm supposed to do here. Um, I'm looking at the bottom of the controls. Looks like you can control music, the pixel, the cursor speed, pulse rate, pulse width. You can turn the sequencer off or on and the sequencer speed. So lots of options here. And of course you would use the keyboard for this, I believe, um, on your um, 8-bit computer at the time. And there's also a left menu, I believe. So we'll go down there and check that out in a second. Here we go. We have a preset, a stash slot, primitive, symmetry, tracking, and more stuff. So really cool. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, um, but you can definitely control what's on the screen by moving the cursor. It is very cool. Just so ahead of his time. Um, Whenever I had heard the Jaguar CD had a uh, like a light show in it, I did not realize that Jeff Minter had a hand in that. So here is the manual for this psychedelia for the C64. Very cool. And again, as I said, I do have a floppy for color space, like a large floppy for color space for my APIC computer, and it works great. So pretty cool to see these games, these apps, I guess you could say here. All right, guys, just full disclosure here. When I was filming this, I had some echoing in my audio, so I'm replacing that bit here, <laughs> as one does in editing. But, uh, yeah, just a really cool program. Um, <clears throat> I think I was saying here, I was talking about my version of this game on my uh, large floppy for my Atari 8-bit computers. Um, I basically got that off of eBay and um, in, a, in a set from other ones, but really cool. Really cool game. Minterviews. I dropped the game I was working on and spent the next two weeks coding like a demon. I'd never worked so hard at anything in my life, nor have I ever wanted anything so much as I wanted to complete the light synth. 1985. Very cool. Love it. Minterviews. Psychedelic is for me the fulfillment of a personal dream, and in my opinion, the best thing I've ever written. What you see on your 64 just might be the first small step into a new fusion of color sonics. The best is yet to come, and maybe I'll be one of the first to get there. 1984. Psychedelia, original painting. The Stargate sequence in 2001 A Space Odyssey made a big impression on me, so when Jeff started his light synthesizers, I was fully on board, says artist Steiner Lunt. The square background pattern meant a lot of careful masking before using the airbrush. Love it. Alright, light synth notes. Various notes from early light synth development showing the designs for some of the on-screen patterns. Psychedelia ad. You cannot win, you cannot lose, only enjoy. An early ad for Psychedelia lets would-be buyers know that Jeff's latest is no game at all. The December 84 issue of Popular Computing Weekly, in which this app was first featured, also included a sneak preview Psychedelia demo program that users could type in themselves to test out. Just love that. Alright, moving on. Light Synth. Jeff recounts the tale of how he created Psychedelia, the first in a long line of light synthesizers. Let's watch another video, guys. I was lying in my bedroom in the dark and listening to Pink Floyd. And in my head, I would imagine like sort of abstract geometric shapes sort of doing stuff in time to the music. For a long time, these abstract visions were just in my head. As I went through school, that kind of went to the back of my mind. And at first, when I was programming games, it didn't really occur to me that I could use the computer to do that. One day I was out for a run and I just thought, well, you know, why don't I try doing, you know, using some of this tech that I've got for making games and make something that's not a game and why not try and, and just do a, a single approximation of what this thing I'd had in mind, this machine to externalise the abstract stuff in your head to go, you know, how you might go about making one of those. And so I came up with this like 1K program, which I, I called Psychedelia. You just have this dot, and you move the dot around. 
You press the button, and all these flowing patterns would come out. And you could put symmetry on them. So you could kind of direct this in time to the music. It was lovely. And it blew my mind just how cool this was to play with. And I got my mates around and I said, yeah, you've got to try this. And sat them down and put on the Floyd and gave them the joysticks. And said, yeah, just do this. And, and you know, people really enjoyed it. And it was so nice. It was so pure. It was something else. I felt like I'd broken through into some area where not, not many people had been working. In fact, people had been working there. It was actually only years later I found out that Atari made the Atari video music in 1977. When I did find other people doing it, I kind of felt validated, really. I felt, oh, there is something here that's worth looking at. There is something that's perhaps worth moving forward and, uh, and looking at in a bit more detail. I felt that it was something that was too pure and too 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 good in itself. You know, it, it was just too pure to be commercialised. I wanted to just give it away, um, and I did. I gave the original version. I gave away as a listing. I put it published in magazines. It was a hex listing. You put this thing in. Eventually, we thought, okay, we will, we will do a version for sale, uh, uh, an extended version, which we sold. It wasn't very expensive. We released it, and the reviews were very much polarised. It was probably one of the most divisive things I've ever done, because you had, um, like, some people were obviously, you know, they'd been waiting for something like this to come along, and there was you know, a few reviewers who were really, really, really just, like, got it straight away. There's this one guy who said the review was something like, um, I find mere words too cumbersome to describe the brilliance of this concept or something like that. I'm thinking, well, that's the best review I've ever had and probably the best review I'm ever likely to get. And then for the same programme, somebody else saying, what an absolute load of rubbish, what the hell does Minter think he's doing? So... But I knew I was onto something. He's embracing the medium in such a radically different way from anybody else. And he's not even sure, I don't think he's even sure about why or how he's doing it. It's the sort of thing you could put your mum in front of the telly and you wouldn't have to explain it to her. You just put a joystick in her hand and say, what is that? And instantly it's like, I, I get it. I, I can see what I'm doing, I get it. But by waggling this stick, something's happening on the screen. And, um, you know, I think that's part of the appeal because it's certain it would draw people in that wouldn't necessarily normally be into computers at all. Um, I was aware of his games, but like I think it was one of the Atari shows that I actually first saw Jeff's light synths when he was demoing Colours at the time. Graphics was certain I was really into, and this this interactive real time graphics on a computer, which was certain you only ever imagined was certain you're going to see on the TV, um, bringing out onto a home computer that totally grabbed me. And when the eight bit version of Color Space came out. I was totally hooked. Ever since then, it's been all about the light since for me. Such a cool video. Love these. So moving on here. Mama Llama. Originally sketched out in the notebook during Jeff's trip to Peru, Mama Llama was his most complex game design yet. Players had to protect a family of llamas using a killjoy to eliminate enemies in a series of over a hundred waves. They used a complex strategy grid to pick which wave to play next, while using items to keep more enemies from spawning in other areas. Very cool. So, just just uh, FYI, this is a hard game. <laughs> Complexity 5, Blazing Llamas 85 for the C64. Considered the most complex Llamasoft's games, Mama Llama combines arcade action with the complex strategy grid that players must play to survive. Very cool. So let's go ahead and play this. Now I have no idea what I'm doing here and this is a little complex so bear with me folks.
Definitely an interesting game. Uh, very hard to, so just FYI, I'm going to put this on the screen. Feel free to read all this. A rather unusual video game by Jeff Mentor. I can see why this got a little, little bit of blowback. It's a little more complicated, um, for sure. Um, I love the art design, though, and the, the graphics. You can tell a lot of love went into this. But uh, Jeff goes on to admit this, too. It was just too complex for the time and um, not as accessible as some of his other shooter games. So... Uh, Just jumping around. <laughs> so basically what I come to find out is you control uh, the way the orb goes, I believe. And that helps you shoot enemies on the screen. You pre-plan that with the map in the beginning. So kind of complex, but there you go. Of course, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but definitely uh, dig into this one if you would like on the collection yourself. Um, <clears throat> it is one of the more complex games, but here you go. There's the rewind feature at the bottom. Not sure what else to do here. <laughs> but it is a gorgeous game, right? Alright, let's move on to the next one, guys. Mama Llama Original Painting. This was more of a humorous cartoon artwork focused on the faces of Mama Llama and her offspring, says artist Steiner Lund. They would easily be recognized when reduced to the size of cassette covers. Nice. Mama Llama Preliminary Sketches. Four original concept sketches by Steiner Lund for the Mama Llama box art, as well as the original sketch of the logo. Mama Llama Drama. While Jeff loved the complexity of his latest release, the game critics of the time weren't as enamored with Mama Llama. Jeff and Zap64 reviewer Gary Penn share their sides of the story. Let's check this out. It's really interesting because you look at his work, it starts with knockoffs of other games, but with um, things that he's had in the self. You can see that he's going, oh, can I even do this? And then over time, there's like a, a lot of experimentation. I developed quite an interest in, in just trying to do stuff that was a bit different than the arcade style stuff that people do. I think, oh, we've got these machines, you can do anything with them if you want. Why not try out some new ways of doing things? And sometimes it went a bit too far. I just wanted to have this different idea where instead of having a main character with a gun always shooting something, you had your main character was effectively controlling a little droid and protecting the flock with this, by just moving this little droid around. The controls were very weird. It's kind of game. It probably would have worked better with a mouse than with a than with a digital joystick. But as it was, it was a bit inaccessible, and that was reflected in its review scores from some places. And the guy who did the review for Zack Magazine is a guy who previously had sent me a very nice letter saying how how much he. He enjoyed, I think it was Ancipital, and that part of the reason he got the job at Zap was because he'd shown people his skills on Ancipital. <laughs> and so I thought I was tremendously disloyal for this guy to immediately join up with them and then pan my bloody game. I think the thing that Jeff didn't understand was um, I didn't like half of his games, but I, I, the, the half I did like, I loved. Um, and it wasn't anything about him. For me, the, the opportunity on Zap was just a sort of conduit to play some more stuff and share opinions. 
So of course, one of the first games we review is, is a Jeff game. So I'm like, yes! Uh, get to see a Jeff game before it's released or whatever. I can't remember what it was. I was really excited about that. Um, uh, yeah, I just didn't get on with it at all. It was all just experimentation. It wasn't done out of bloody mindedness. One of the things I did like in Mamalama was the grid that you could move around to play the levels in different orders. It was just like, let's see what happens. Does this work? I think it works. Maybe, you know, people don't agree with me, but at least I tried. There's more than one magazine didn't like it. That the failing was, because this is all sort of new ground doing all these reviews in this way, critiquing was not, at, uh, at the time, was just more just a, pretty much an opinion. It wasn't a, a proper critique of what did work, what didn't work, why it probably didn't work. Here's my ideas about why, I don't think it worked. It was more a case of you'd write about what it was about and you'd give an opinion. That was it. So that was the, that was the structure, that was the framework within which you were working. I was being a bit precious about my design when it came down to it. The criticism was fair play. It was, it was not my most accessible thing. I still think it's, it's quite a nice game, but I wasn't that good at game design yet. I, I wasn't good enough to make that game work well. In fact, if I was doing it now, I could make that game work properly. But anyway, it's all water under the bridge now. I just love these videos, guys. That was just so cool. All right, moving on here. Let's check the next one out. Nature of the Beast, issue four. Extensive features on Psychedelia and Mama Llama highlight this issue of the Llama Soft newsletter. This issue also includes a brief history of the Zyaxian Empire, a lengthy backstory that ties the various plots of Llama Soft games together. Awesome. L.E.T. Show, January 85. It was difficult to miss the Lamasop booth at any computer fair at which the company exhibited. At this January 85 show, visitors drawn to the booth by the sheep statue could play Mama Llama to their heart's content. <laughs> I love the statue uh, that he has up there of the llama. That's cool, the sheep. Zap Review. While Jeff was excited about the complexity and the experimental gameplay of Mama Llama, its reception was unusually mixed for a Lamasop game. This review from May 85 issue of Zap, which sharply criticized the gameplay and graphics, caused a lengthy kerfuffle between Mentor and the magazine. Letters to Zap. Zap's review of Mama Llama caused months of debate in the magazine's letters column between the magazine's editors and Llama Soft fans. Mama Llama ad, a full page ad for Mama Llama from April 85. Mama Llama notes, notes and level designs from the development of Mama Llama. I love saying that, Mama Llama, Mama Llama. <laughs> cool name for a game for sure. All the beasties. A Llama Soft ad from early 85 brought all the animal protagonists of Jeff's recent games together for a family photo. This also included Rory the Savage guinea pig, based on a real-life pet of Llama Soft fan, who had made his debut as an antagonist in Antipsipital. Minterviews. Rory came about because I received a letter from a girl asking me if I could put her pet guinea pig Rory into a game somewhere. Naturally, I couldn't just have him in the game running around squeaking and eating bits of hay, so I turned him into Rory the Savage Guinea Pig, who was one of the most fearsome creatures in the game. Animals ad, original painting. This was commissioned by Llama Soft for the front cover of the Software Index magazine, recalls artist Steiner Lund. Beautiful. Jeff Minter, magazine columnist. For a period of three months in mid-85, Jeff began writing a regular column for Zap Magazine, in which he discussed his views on the video game business.
Color Space. Jeff quickly created versions of Psychedelia for several computer platforms. When it came to the Atari 8-bit platform, he realized that the hardware allowed him to do so much more with the light synthesizer that the Atari version would be almost a completely new product. He called this Enhanced Light Synth Color Space. And I actually do own this on Floppy, and it is a really cool program. Let's take a look at this and play it. Color Space Atari 8-Bit 85 Complexity 4 Llamas Llamasoft's second light synthesizer was a vastly upgraded version of Psychedelia for Atari 8-Bit computers that gave the user many more controls. Just so neat. So just like the other synthesizer, we have, um, we have options on here to affect the gameplay. This is exactly what it looks like on my Atari 8-Bit, by the way. So many options. I'm just loving Jeff's foray into the use of light synthesis in his programs. Just, just so cool. Um, I was always a fan of the iTunes light uh, visualizer, and now I know where this comes from, <laughs> more or less. But Atari did actually work on the Atari Music video player in 77, or Atari Video Music, which kind of did the same thing, but he didn't know about that. However, his is much more enhanced. So there are the instructions, and let's go ahead and go back into the program and see if I've missed anything. Just so fascinating. Let me know what you think down below about color space. Of course, this inspired Jeff to go on and make the VLM for the Atari Jaguar, which is basically the same thing, just way more updated. And uh, you put in CDs in your Jaguar CD and it starts this up all the time. Um, and there are options on the Jag controller, just about everything you could think of. So very similar to this as well. Such a cool one. Let me know what you think down below about color space. Mint reviews. The difference between psychedelic and color space is as pronounced as the difference between a Mini and a Ferrari. Using the Atari, you can get curved screens, harbor reflections, interlace effects, strobe stroboscopics, dynamic color flows, and variable resolution screens. That was hard to read. Color Space Original Painting. The artwork includes all the lettering and the Llama Soft logo. This meant a lot of fine masking, says Steiner Lund. Color Space Ad. Advertisement for Color Space that began running in June 1985. Nature of the Beast, Issue 5. Color Space is the lead story in the fifth issue of the Llamasoft Fan Newsletter. Other stories include Jeff's first experience with the 16-bit Atari ST computer, which would become a major part of his game des design career shortly enough. Yes, the ST took over everything, I think, and especially in Britain. Um, it was a really big computer in England and other territories, even more so than maybe even America, so pretty interesting. And the Spectrums, of course, and the Commodores. Love that. <laughs> color space is everywhere. You've actually been looking at color space for a while now. The moving backgrounds in these timelines are being generated in real time by the original Atari 8-bit color space program. Oh, very cool. I had no idea. That is so neat that they did that. 
Light synths on display. Psychedelia, Mama Llama, and Color Space are on display at this unidentified computer show from mid-1985. Llama Softies. Everywhere that Jeff went, the Llama Softies were sure to go. The British computer shows of the 1980s were the likely family reunions for Jeff and his loyal fans, a tradition that continues today. Let's check out another video. I like going to the Play Expo because it's really nice. People just come up and uh, we can hang out and play some games. Yeah, to me, it's a great privilege when I meet people who actually enjoy the stuff that much. I think it's quite something when you meet somebody and they still remember playing Buddy Attack and the Mutant Camels or Grid Runner and they'll tell you how much they enjoyed it. I mean, the fact that they still remember it after all these years is one thing. The fact that they actually seek you out and tell you about it is entirely another. One of the lovely things about meeting Jeff is that you could walk up to him and be kind of like, hi, I'm going to talk to you about your games and effectively your work for half an hour. And he's just kind of like, yeah, let's talk about the Jaguar. Let's talk about this. Here's a project I've tried to make that never got finished. I've always enjoyed that. One of the things I enjoyed in the old days was going with Llamasoft to the old 8-bit computer shows. The Llamasoft stand was like, you know, it was like Mecca to all of us lot. It was just like, what's new, what's new, we've got to go and find Jeff's stand. And you'd find, you'd see it from miles away. <laughs> you know that's going to be Jeff's stand, because like, there's this huge plushy sheep on top of the booth or something. For us, it was never really about selling. It was about you know, letting people come up and you know, I'd be out the front and we'd play games together and, uh, and they, could, they could chat to us. And... It was just a tremendously exciting time and also it was great fun. I mean, going up to the shows, meeting people, meeting the people from the other software houses. It was like a big group of mates all having a wonderful time. If there was a computer show on in the UK, Jeff and his mum and dad were going to be there. You know, when I was a young lad, I'd always like, you know, go say hi. And... There's so many people that I know today that I still remember from back in the day that were young kids that would turn up on the stand. You know, it's people from all walks of life. So you'd, you'd always see a few of the regulars that would be at every show, but you know, it'd be the excitable kids like myself that it was just like, you know, this is, this is fantastic. I love all this trippy graphic stuff. You know, you'd get people who'd go along and their dad, you know, probably had no interest in computers and he'd go along and strike up a conversation with Jeff's dad. I remember that distinctly. With dad, I'd be talking to Jeff's dad about something, you know, that dad's talked about at the time. It's like, oh, I don't get all this newfangled computer stuff, but, you know, the boys do. You know, Jeff's, you know, he's a pretty quiet guy, as you know, but it, it a show he would be completely engrossed in, you know, flying one of the light synths or playing one of the games. And he'd get a little bit of a crowd show up just to watch him play in his own games. I went to a couple of shows at what, the Earl's Court or whatever back in the day, a PCW show or something. And I'd go past the Llamasoft stand, but Jeff wasn't there. So, and it, I don't think back then when I was a teenager, it would have ever have occurred to me to try and hang out with Jeff Minter. And then when I was in my late twenties, I was working for magazines and I'd got to interview quite a few big names. So I became a bit more blasé about it. So I'm of the feeling you should, you know, people say you never meet your heroes. I think you should always meet your heroes if you get the chance, because sometimes they turn out to be fantastic. No one else is Jeff Minter or could be Jeff Minter. That, that's just what he was. And that, that came with a whole bunch of bits and pieces to do with stuff they put in his games. Um, it looked a bit rock starish and, and hippie-ish as well, because it was part of what you were buying, I think. And that stuff was always communicated directly to his fans. I like to do these, these newsletters, you see the newsletter called The Nature of the Beast, and I'd sit down and just write a chatty little newsletter style thing talking about what I was doing. One of the first games of his I bought 
had his address. And he said, uh, for a newsletter, right to. And I thought, yeah, go on then, let's see what this is about. And not thinking it would be anything, I thought it would just be advertising and stuff, you know. And the first one arrived, I think it was number one. I read it and I went, wow, <laughs> wow, what? <laughs> is this guy for real? Yeah, and then they kept coming. Uh, I think I, I, I don't remember where you had to send them stamped addressed envelope. Every time you got one, you sent one back. I think that was the deal, but um, yeah, he used to write them quite regularly. It was news about how he was developing the games and other things that happened. You know, it just keep you informed. It's just great. Everyone else was just a company or a product, and Jeff was Jeff. Programming for me um, started from the inspiration of, of being a fan of these people like Jeff that were sitting at home making their own games. Um, you'd read about him doing this in the magazines at the time. Um, he, he used to do great interviews. Uh, they, they, they were so vivid the way that he told the story of what he was up to, what inspired him. Um, and I was thinking, yeah, I could do that. That was just totally different. It was his heart on the page and it was his heart in the game. And that inspired me. That was just amazing. I love that. Betalix. Undeterred by the mixed critical reception from Amalama, Jeff continued to create complex experimental computer games. Battlelix was actually made up of six different mini-games that the player could swap between at any time, bringing back various gameplay elements and characters from previous LamaSoft releases. Let's take a look at this cassette and play some Battlelix. I think that's how you pronounce it, Battlelix. So this is a compilation, very cool. Okay, Battlelix, Commodore 64, 85, Complexity 4 Llamas, a collection of six sub-games that the player can swap between at any time. Hallucino, Bomblets, Bullets Kill Enemies and Kick Your Ship Backwards, AMC2, Blast the Onslaught of Mutant Camels, The Activation of the Iridus Base, Match the On-Screen Patterns to Light the Pyramid, Sippy on the Run, Paint the Corridors Colorfully by Running on Them, Synchro 2, Stop the Aspheres by Changing the Velocity of the Squares, and Psychedelia, Take a Break with the Light Synthesizer. Let's take a look at this. Seems pretty complex.
Just awesome guys. Let me know what you think about Battlex. Very complex program, but it's got lots of cool stuff in there. Battlex original painting. The main image, title, and Lama Soft logo are all part of the artwork, says artist Steiner Lund. The main figure was rendered with pen and black ink, then airbrushed with color inks. The title and six panels were achieved using spatter airbrush technique to mimic a stone. What did that say? Texture. Very cool. Battlex ad. Jeff's hairiest game yet proclaimed this full page ad for Battlex. Love it. Nature of the Beast, issue 6. Battlex is the focus of the sixth issue of Nature of the Beast, Lamasoft's fan newsletter. Very cool. All right, moving on here. PCW Show 85. The popular Computer World Computer Show held in the Olympia Exhibition Center in London. Let Lama Softies get hands on with Battlex and Color Space. Yak's Progress. Yax Progress was a single cassette tape release that collected eight of Jeff's Commodore 64 titles into one package, again with extensive liner notes that described the behind-the-scenes history of each game. 
Jeff notes that the games began as simple, sometimes in his opinion inferior, VIC-20 conversions, but soon grew more complex to take advantage of the C64 graphics. Very cool. Let's take a look at this one, guys. <clears throat> Yak's Progress, original painting. I enjoy painting a cartoon version of Jeff, sporting a Pink Floyd t-shirt, listening to music on his Wattmic cassette player, says artist Steiner Lund. The chrome effect lettering was inspired by American airbrush artists Mouse and Mikey. Is that what that said? Mouse and Kelly. Yak's Progress Manual. The manual for Yak's Progress included notes on the design process for each of the included games, as well as a larger backstory connecting many of the games through the tale of the Zyaxian Empire. I love that he's tying these together into a one universe. That is very cool. Kind of like uh, Howard Scott Warshaw's games. Yak's Progress ad. The majority of this December 85 Lamasov ad was devoted to the release of Yak's Progress, listing JM's historical notes as a selling point. All right. Mentor interviewed. The January 86 issue of Zap featured a lengthy interview with Jeff in which he discussed the Mama Lama controversy as well as his broader views on the changes in the games industry, which he saw as continuing to shut out small devs like himself who wanted to sell their independently created games at low prices. Slay it with flowers. Atari ST. The summer of 85 brought a pair of competing high-end 16-bit computers, the ST from Atari and the Amiga from Commodore. Although Jeff had been a devoted Commodore user since the days of the PET, he found himself more attracted to the ST as a dev platform and quickly set about creating a new generation of games. Really cool. I actually have an ST myself, the inferior base model, the 520. <laughs> Color space comes to ST. With the ST's significant jump in graphic resolution and on-screen colors, it made sense to Jeff to quickly create a version of color space for the ST. Jeff launched the game on February 10th, 86 with a music and light show at the iconic London Planetarium. That is so neat. I just love that. Color Space Atari ST Original Painting A large landscape format artwork with alien blue heads creating or sucking in a spiral galaxy, says artist Steiner Lund of this work. The Babel Fish in the ear is a nod to the UK radio show Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Love it. Color Space Floppy Disk Atari ST version. The floppy disk for Color Space on the Atari ST. Getting into the floppy era. Nature of the Beast Issue 8. The 8th issue of Lama Sauce Fan Newsletter, The Nature of the Beast, covered the launch party for Color Space's Atari ST version, alongside a preview of Lama Sauce's next game, Iridus Alpha, which is actually a very cool game. That's on my Evercade as well, and I can't wait to play that. That's going to come up here in just a second. I think that was on the C64 collection for the Evercade VS and um, EXP. Love that artwork, too. Iridus Alpha. Jeff's next C64 game was with a new twist on the scrolling shoot 'em up in which the player controlled two different crafts on the top and bottom of the screen, transferring energy between them. Let's take a look at this. Can't wait to play this again. This is a fun game, but pretty complex too. Let's see, a little more approachable though. C64 86 Complexity 5 Blazing Llamas. The Zyaxians and Gilbies are at war in the planet Iridus Alpha, a complex scrolling shoot 'em up in which the player must swap between controlling Gilby robot fighters on the upper and lower halves of the screen. Let's play this, guys. I can't wait. Thank <laughs> you. 
Very cool game, guys. As I said, Aridus Alpha is one of my favorites. I have this on my Evercade on the C64 collection and love it on there as well. Here are the, um, ooh, a free poster offer. Here are the instructions with a lot more information than we're used to. Very cool. And the story behind the game, which adds a lot more to the gameplay in my opinion. Feel free to pause this and read this. I read most of these offline and they are very cool i just don't have time to read absolutely everything i'd be here all day so let's go to the next one guys iridus alpha original painting jeff must have glimpsed the future of drones as integral weapons in warfare says steiner lund the composition utilizes a symmetrical theme in this case the hovering drone set against the chaotic background of flames and smoke could not resist adding the infinity glyph as an insignia love it Iridus Alpha Review. In a review published in October 86, Iridus Alpha was called the best shoot 'em up on the C64 by one editor of Zap Magazine. That looks very neat. Mint Reviews. Iridus shows a way for the shoot 'em up to evolve, gaining depth and a degree of complexity, but still remaining playable and very blastable, whereas many blasting games become boring very quickly, lacking any objective beyond mere destruction of alien ships. Iridus gives the player plenty to think about. <clears throat> From the manual. Developer Diaries from May to September 86, Zap Magazine published a dev diary for Iridus Alpha, in which Jeff broke down his day-to-day -day work on the game, as well as everything else that was going on in his life at the time. I love this. The Daily Llama. Iridus Alpha Ad. Iridus Alpha was distributed by a publisher called Houston and shown off in this full-color ad starting at September 86. Nature of the Beast, Issue 9. Once Iridus Alpha was finished, Jeff produced another issue of the Lamasoft Fan Newsletter in which he discussed the game and his future plans. Vivivic. With the Commodore VIC-20 winding down in the marketplace and some Alamasoft games having gone out of print, it released a compilation cassette called Viva Vic. 
Notable here are the liner notes, which comp comprise a historical look back at the importance of the VIC-20, as well as Jeff's thoughts on each of the eight games. It's got Andy's attack on there, Laser Zone, Tracks, Hellgate, all kinds of cool stuff. Vivivic, original painting. A comic book style sci-fi featuring a tough guy llama. This was great fun to do, says Steiner Lund. I am very fond of this. Love it. He needs a name. It says, Vivivic Preliminary Sketch. Steiner Lund's original sketch of the Vivivic box art painting. Vivivic Manual. Vivivic's manual included Jeff's thoughts and context around each of the included games. Now, this is actually very cool. If you want to pause this and read this, he goes into great detail about his feelings on these games. Uh, Grid Runner, the big one, the game that put him on the map is in there. Matrix, very cool. Definitely go and read that if you have time. Don Ruhew, having achieved international success and widespread recognition as a game developer, Jeff now took the next logical step, moving out of his parents' house into a little house in a beautiful and peaceful valley in the middle of nowhere in West Wales. I can't even pronounce that name. Dan Hrieu, <laughs> Molly and Flossie. Shortly after moving to Wales, Jeff got Molly as first sheep. But sheep got lonely in isolation, and Molly jumped to the fence in search of a friend. So Jeff brought home another sheep. Flossie and the two of them were happy thereafter. In later years, Flossie became a mascot of Llamasoft, well known to fans of the games and throughout the world. Very cool. Beautiful pictures. And what nice sheep. Interviews. I first got them just thinking they'd be handy just to keep the grass down, but didn't really anticipate they'd be particularly interesting as companion animals, but I was very wrong. Sheep are brilliant. They can be affectionate and loving. They like cuddles and fuss. If anything, they behave like giant cats. They'll come up and rub around your legs and lean on you. I've known sheep that will curl up in your lap if you sit down in the field. They are brilliant. These two taught me that. Here's the, C uh, the Commodore 16. Introduced in 84, the Commodore 16 was a low-powered, low-cost computer intended to replace the aging VIC-20. It flopped in the U.S. and the platform sold well in Europe. Awesome. Void Runner. Void Runner, the third entry in the Grid Runner series, was originally released on Commodore 16, but was soon ported to other platforms. The Centipede-inspired gameplay was still in place, with the new twist being that the player now controlled an array of four different ships. And this is actually a very fun game. I never played this before, and I had such a great time here. So let's play some Void Runner. Complexity 2 Llamas and 87 for the Commodore 64. The third entry in the Grid Runner series, this one puts the player in control of an array of four ships that changes configurations in each level. Let's play it, guys.
Oh man, that was so fun. I love Void Runner. That was just amazing. Here's the instruction manual for the game. This one is so fun. I definitely recommend some Void Runner. I like that a lot. Void Runner C64 review. Later in 87, Jeff ported Void Runner to the C64. It was reviewed positively in Zap Magazine. Nature of the Beast, Issue 10. In this issue of the Lomasoft Newsletter, Jeff discusses Iridus Alpha and Void Runner, as well as several upcoming projects, including a new light synthesizer currently being titled Color Space 2. Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2. Jeff's final C64 game was a return to the giant marching beasties that first marked Lamasoft as a maker of profoundly weird experiences. Revenge 2 kept the original game's basic gameplay while adding a level select grid reminiscent of, but less complex than... What did it say there? Very cool cassette. Like a complex than Mama Llama strategy board. Let's play this. Three Camels, Complexity 87, C64. Let's play us some Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2, guys.
Okay, I don't know what I was doing there, but interesting game for sure. Feel free to check this one out some more in the compilation. It has a lot of different settings there, and I didn't want to spend the time to sit there and read that. So, um, But really cool game. Let's check it out. There we go. All right. RMC2 Review. Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2 was another critically acclaimed hit for Llamasoft, judging by this review in Zap Magazine, where it scored 90%. Revenge 2 Cassette Tape. The cassette tape for the C64 version of Revenge 2. Tripatron. While Jeff usually completed his projects within a matter of weeks or months, he spent an entire year developing Tripatron, the most complex fully featured light synthesizer ever developed by Llamasoft. In addition to letting users generate color patterns with the joystick, Tripatron incorporated a full scripting language that performers could use to craft practically whatever custom light effects they could imagine. Here is an ad for Tripatron. Uh, very cool. Distinguished a light synthesizer from a video game. Nice. Merak. As he was building Tripatron, Jeff worked with music composer Adrian Wagner to create a combined light sound album called Merak. Wagner composed the music with Tripatron's capabilities in mind, and Jeff added features to Tripatron based on the needs of the Merak project. It was released on VHS tape shortly after Tripatron's launch. Let's take a look.
Very cool, guys. That was really neat. Let's move on here. Mentorviews. In many ways, this program was designed for the album, and the music was designed for the light scent. Our concept was ambitious from the start, and it soon came to realize that no mere extension of color space would be sufficient to realize what we wanted to do. Tripping Delight Fantastic. An October 88 article from the Games Machine interviews Jeff about Tripatron, praising its complexity but noting that it is unlikely to sell in large numbers. Tripatron ST Manual. A massive 80 page manual accompanied Tripatron that walked the player through its extensive feature set, as well as provided some insight into Jeff's work with LightSense. While Tripatron is not included in this compilation, flipping through this manual can give you some sense of how complex and ambitious a project it was. It was very ambitious, so I'm not going to show every page here, guys, just because it would take me a while. It's 80 pages uh, for a game that's not on the compilation, it said, so... But here it is, definitely a part of history. I would love to actually get my hands on this and play it. I guess you can in emulation as well. Maybe put it on the Atari 400 Mini and see what happens. All right, let's move on here. The Llama Soft Look. Developers, artists, critics, and Jeff himself discuss the unique aesthetics that run throughout the history of Llama Soft's game library. Another video, here we go. What Jeff Minter has going for him is a style not only inspired by the 1980s, but a look that is uh, inspired by psychedelic art. The stuff I do, I mean, it's quite fair to call it neo-retro because it, it takes a lot of the ethos and the design philosophy from retro games. But also, we can mess around with lots of trippy new stuff and go crazy with particles and all kinds of effects that we couldn't do back in the day. Back in the early days, uh, when the hardware was quite limited, then like, the scope of your game design was really defined by what the hardware could do and also what what you could do with the hardware. When he's just designing graphics for himself, I think coder art is the kind way to put it. His games were quite unusual compared to most of the others in the sense that um, there were so many animals. Because he would have the animals doing things and chasing each other or whatever and uh, blasting each other. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not like soldiers or anything, it's, it's, it's animals. Creating a new world where, you know, animals are doing weird stuff. I sent him some drawings I'd done of a kind of a half man, half goat thing. And it was just doodling, but I'd just read um, Brian Aldiss's um, Heliconia Spring, I think was the first one. And then it was about these two races of this sort of humanoid, this sort of half goaty thing, which uh, and they they had a there was the, I believe it was the the sun it was called Batalix. So when I I did these drawings anyway, and I put them all onto one sheet and I sent them to Jeff and I gave him the title of Batalix because it seemed to fit. And I think he must have fallen off his chair when he saw them because. He got in touch with me and he said, have I got a brain leak or something? He said, this is going to be the title for my next game. I hadn't told anybody. Ah, and I think that's what prompted him to ask me to do the screen. Having this sort of space background, the ships and things blowing up. And there had to be some animals, you know. And he, he liked it so much, he, uh, he, he, he put it in the game. Well, this realist aspect is propelling for him as well. You can see the Salvador Dali there. I was influenced, as I'm sure many of us were, Matthew Smith included, by things like Monty Python. Love Python, so love sticking that kind of abstract weird humour in the game. It's, it's just part of being British. My games are very British. Somebody said that to me in the, in the talk I gave the other day, and it's true. I'm, as British as a cup of tea. Yeah, in the last 20 years, he's obviously been kind of associated with this rave visual aesthetic. When that happened with Tempest 2000, when I discovered the visual feedback effects I had in there. And that informed not only stuff 
in Tempest 2000, but also the stuff that went into the VLM, because that used it extensively. You play the game uh, by Jeff Minter. You're definitely inside his mind. And I think, you know, maybe that's part of uh, the success of Jeff as an artist. You know, you're not only you're playing one of his games, but you're inside his head as well. All right, guys, so next time we're actually going to be taking a look at the next chapter, chapter four. Whoops, let me go back. <laughs> chapter four is the Tempest. It says, Lamasaw finds its existence in peril as it attempts to navigate the raging storm of the British games industry. Well, check that out next time, guys, in part five, the final part for the Jeff Mentor story, Lamasaw by Digital Eclipse. You guys subscribe, like, and comment. Have a great one. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you.